My name's Tom Pasternak. I'm a partner at Steptoe and Johnson in town. Uh, this panel will not surprisingly will be discussing a couple patent cases. The Alice Corp v. CLS Bank case and the Nautilus versus Biosig Instruments case. I'm going to introduce the panel. Um, their full biographies are in your material, so I won't spend the time going through that. And this proceeding to my left, Constantine Trella, who was counsel to Alice Corp from Sidley and Austin in town in Chicago. Mark Perry, who was counsel to CLS Bank International, who's a partner at Gibson Dunn in DC. John Vandenberg, who was counsel to Nautilus, Inc. And John's a partner at Clarkquist Sparkman in Portland, Oregon. Then we have Professor Rebecca Eisenberg from the University of Michigan and Professor Ronald Mann from Columbia Law School. The first case we're going to talk about, Alice Corp v. CLS Bank, deals with the standard of patentability for computer software-related inventions. In that case, the Supreme Court held that Alice Corp's patent claims that disclosed schemes for managing certain forms of financial risk were drawn to the abstract idea of intermediate settlement and that merely requiring gen generic computer Im implementation fails to transform that abstract into, patentable, into a patentable invention. The second case, Nautilus v. Biosig Instrument, dealt with a standard for indefiniteness under one, Section 112 of the Patent Code. The su Supreme Court there held that a patent is in invalid for indefiniteness if its claims read in light of the patent's specification and prosecution history fail to inform with reasonable certainty those skilled in the art about the scope of the invention at the time the application was filed. So let's start with Alice v. CLS Bank, and I'll start with Mr. Trella, or Connie. Yeah, thanks. Does the court's decision provide enough guidance to the patent office and lower courts on what computer-implemented inventions are patentable subject matter? Well, I think the, the court's decision certainly provides some guidance. Uh, we know, for example, that merely reciting uh, generic computer uh, components isn't enough. Uh, we also know that in a computer-implemented invention that actually improves uh, the operation of a computer, the way the computer processes or handles data, uh, that seems, uh, the court said, to be patentable subject matter. But there's a pretty big area in between, and I'm not sure that the court has given a lot of guidance uh, in, on that. So uh, uh, I guess my answer would be some, but perhaps not enough. And I think we're going to see that as, as uh, the courts grapple with the post-Alice landscape. Mark, what do you think about that? you think there's enough guidance? Well, I guess. Enough is the question, the loaded yeah. word in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I agree with Connie, there is guidance, um, important guidance. Um, but the question is, how much is enough? And this is an area that I think there's a, there's a jurisprudential or philosophical debate about the level of clarity that Section 101 should embody, both for the examination core uh, and for the courts. And I think. Um, you know, depending on whether you're holding the patent or attacking it, your, your perspective uh, understandably changes. And if you're running a government agency, your, your, your perspective changes. But there is a value, in my view, to having a certain amount of um, play in the joints here. Uh, and I think the Supreme Court has quite deliberately been staying away from a check-the-box kind of system or kind of, kind of approach to 101. Um, all of which is a long way of saying it provides guidance and it's enough in the Supreme Court's view uh, because I think they are deliberately being incremental here. David Kappas is right. There have been a lot of these cases um, in part because of what the Federal Circuit has, how the Federal Circuit has reacted to the Supreme Court's decisions in this area. Um, but I think the court has tried not, deliberately tried not to craft a uh, fit every case answer every problem standard. Why that is is a different question, but I, but I think it's an, a purposeful uh, outcome rather than an accident. I think this is an important question, so I'm going to have everyone on the panel kind of give me, give me their view. John, can you give me your view? Yeah, I think my sense is if you think about sort of the philosophy and the, the bottom line question, is Section 101 uh, an important threshold issue that really should be enforced rigorously, or is it the course filter backstop? 
which, for instance, Chief Judge Rader was, um, you know, used the coarse filter language in ultramercial and other cases. Um, I think on that level, the Supreme Court has been very clear that 101 is an important threshold issue. Um, so that, that's what I would add. I think they're very clear, and therefore, if um, that's clear now to the trial courts and hopefully to the federal circuit, so if the law needs to change, then it would be up to Congress to change that somehow. Uh, so I don't think it's been very clear at all. Um, I think that there's a, a lack of clarity in particular as to what the court means by abstract idea. Um, we have really no guidance on that. I think it will become clearer, hopefully, eventually, if the court finds something that it thinks does constitute patentable subject matter that it's able to identify so that you can compare uh, uh, the differences. Uh, uh, that, you know, we know that they think cDNA sequences are patent eligible subject matter. Um, uh, but apart from that, we've got to go back to Diamond versus Chakrabarty and Diamond versus Deer in order to identify a clear statement from the uh, a court that this is patent eligible subject matter. Um, uh, so uh, uh, hopefully at some point that will happen uh, for the uh, um, uh, on the electronic, uh, you know, uh, the software slash business methods side of patentable subject matter. Um, uh, certainly, the articulation uh, of what they mean by abstract ideas is, you know, what we said in Bilski. Um, it's, it's, I think, not very, very illuminating. Professor Mann, I think it's they've fallen into this just terribly uh, disappointing cycle. They're probably going to start again this fall. They take a long break over the summer. They come back. It's very pretty in Washington. The leaves turn brown. They're ambitious. We're going to solve the nation's problems, take a big patentability case. <laughs> May or June, you got to write opinions. You're really scared. You're going to ruin the economy if you say anything. So we're going to try and dispose of this case saying as little as possible. Okay, that's step two. Step three is the Federal Circuit has to read this opinion. It's designed to say as little as possible really, really carefully and treat every word of it like it was handed down on Mount Sinai. Then two years later, the Federal Circuit's writing opinions like what you saw from the Federal Circuit in this case, where the opinions make no sense because it's like you know the elephant and the blind people. Everybody reads a different paragraph of Bilski as if they meant that paragraph. That's the paragraph they meant. Well, I think two years from now, the Federal Circuit is the same thing with Alice. We'll have these cases where they have this absurd stuff about generic computers or you know substantial improvement. And everybody in the Federal Circuit will like a different paragraph. They'll write differently. The Supreme Court will take another case. We're going to solve the problem, <laughs> and then they'll say it's not patentable because it's abstract. Could I jump in there? I, yeah. I, I agree with half of that. <laughs> uh, part of the problem is, is overthinking this issue. I mean, at one level, it's not that hard, OK? Bugs in the forest can't be patentable. Bugs you build in the lab can, right? That's the diamond cases. Genes in the body you can't. Genes you build in the lab you can. Economic principles that everybody knows about you can't. What's, on, what's the other goalpost? Well, we, hard to figure out. It, 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 it's, it's a scientific, technological implementation that is not possible without the, the, the uh, basic human activity. You can't do in your mind or with pencil and paper. That's the analog, I would argue, to the bugs in the forest and the bugs in the lab. But, uh, and here's where I agree with Professor Mann, is then, then the Federal Circuit and the district judges get down and implementing that in every case, and, and you can find sentences in every one of these opinions, because they have written too much, that'll support sort of anything, and it, and it throws it all open to the, to the litigators to sort of say, which is, I guess, good for litigators, but, but perhaps not good for the patent system. Well, and I, I think both Mark and Professor Eisenberg, I think, touched on the fundamental problem, and that is the abstract idea is what triggers this, and I think the court has been uh, incredibly unclear on what an abstract idea is. Mark referred to economic concepts that everybody knows, well, OK, to me, that sounds like it's obvious. It doesn't necessarily sound like it's abstract. Uh, if you look at some of the earlier 101 cases, they talked about abstract ideas in the sense of things that are like natural laws, uh, mathematical algorithms or formulas, natural laws, principles. And, and if, you think, if you look back at the rationale the court gave in those cases, why this should not be patentable and why 101 was the right tool, it's because they, they talked about withdrawing things from the storehouse of human knowledge. In other words, concepts that, that were out there either because you know, they were inherent in nature or they were inherent in mathematical relationships. Uh, and that makes sense as a doctrinal matter. Then when, but when you start getting to things that are 
whether they're economic concepts or other kinds of ideas, they may be obvious, they may be anticipated and all of that, but are you, if I come up with some harebrained idea, uh, you know, I, well, I think we can turn cigarette butts into energy, well, that's, that is abstract in the sense that I haven't fleshed it out, but I certainly haven't withdrawn anything from the storehouse of human knowledge. So maybe I have an, uh, uh, you know, a 112 problem. I'm not sure it's a one-on-one -on -one problem. Moving on to a slightly different point, the court also talked about something more that transforms an abstract idea into a patentable invention. The court characterized this as an invented concept. How do we identify the something more that transforms? Well, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> I'm not sure that I... You can finish, too. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure that I... I don't know that there's answers to these. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm fairly certain we're going to conclude that there aren't. Uh, it, it seemed... Obviously, that's something that I think both sides and Alice and, and all of the amici and Alice wrestled with. What exactly does that mean? And, and let's just put to one side whether inventive concept is something that belongs under the one on, 101 umbrella at all, or doesn't it just by definition, sound like it belongs under 102 and 103. Uh, it seemed to, to us that it, if you look at Mayo, Mayo kind of talked about uh, inventive concept in terms of uh, steps other than steps that anybody who wanted to make use of the law of nature would have to, you know, you know, would have to use. So if, if, these, if the steps in your, in your claim were things that the, you, you had to do them if you were going to make use of this law of nature, to, to use Mayo as the, uh, as the example. Well, that wasn't an inventive concept because it was basically inherent, uh, wrapped up in the, uh, the unpatentable law of nature. Uh, but I'm not sure that, uh, that that, to the extent that that was a, uh, a principle, I'm not sure it survives Alice. So after Alice, I'm not really sure what inventive concept means other than something that really you would normally think of as, as obviousness. Well, part of the problem here, and Professor Eisenberg adverted to this, is, is the court is working its way through this problem by defining what things are not uh, rather than what they are. Uh, so we know in the space of computer implemented inventions uh, that if it will run on a uh, totally generic uh, computer system, uh, that is not an inventive concept. And this is sort of the flip side or the, the obverse of the um, issue that the court confronted in Aereo, you know, this, this fear that the justices uh, probably rightfully have of, of not foreclosing innovation and technologies that they totally don't understand. The discussion during the Aereo argument of the cloud computing is rather uh, amusing or horrifying, depending on your perspective, but clearly they don't understand it. Uh, here, they think they understand that if I've got a computer sitting on my desk, as, as most of them now do, uh, and you can just do that, then it must not be inventive because we already have them on our desk and we're old and hidebound and, 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 and not innovative. Therefore, that's not an inventive concept. Is that a satisfactory jurisprudential answer? Of course not, uh, which is Connie's point, I think, one of Connie's points. But it is the answer for this, for this context, which then puts the challenge to the computer implemented a world, the software developers and firmware developers and hardware developers to find that technological innovation on top of the implementation um, issue that was, that was here. And again, it, 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 it all stems from defining it as a negative rather than defining it as a positive. John? Yeah, I think as a, as a defendant challenging a patent under 101, the inventive, uh, the inventive contribution or the something more is not very helpful language. I think the preemptive footprint language from earlier cases has survived Alice. And the notion really is that, you know, the Supreme Court sees patents as a two-edged sword. They use that language in Mayo, I think. And the question is, is the, is the benefit from allowing claims like this outweigh the risk, the downside, the, the taking away from the public? And if you have this so-called abstract idea, whatever it is, and you say, okay, and it's, it's going to be run on a GPS device, um, or a mobile GPS device. Well, now it doesn't matter if it's obvious or not obvious. It's like okay, people can use this apparently on other devices, on, on servers and whatnot. So I think that is perhaps what the court is thinking about. What is the downside of allowing claims like this? If it, the preemptive footprint is small, then we'll allow this. The, the risk from having a claim like this to further innovation is sufficiently small. 
Um, I think inventive concept is a most unfortunate term that makes it sound like what they have in mind. Uh, the, the combination of re reference to inventive concept and reference to conventional activity not being good enough uh, uh, leaves the impression that this is something that's more like a, a 103 inquiry. I'm not sure that's what the uh, uh, court intended. The, the PTO's guidelines have quite have offered a, a bunch of alternative ways. You know, they have a, a list of factors that you can look to in order to see whether there's enough there in addition to whatever the excluded matter is uh, to uh, uh, establish that the patent is not essentially a patent on the excluded matter itself. Um, and I think all of that would work fine. The problem is that we don't have any sense. I think I'm worried more about step one than about step two of the analysis. I think if we had uh, a clearer understanding of what is an abstract idea that's excluded and what is a natural law or natural product, uh, uh, then uh, uh, maybe we wouldn't get to step two so often and we wouldn't have to uh, 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 think that section 101 is collapsing into a sort of a watered down redundant uh, a seat of the pants 103 analysis, which I don't think is, is, is what was intended. So I think we, we spend too much time worrying about step two and not enough time worrying about step one. I guess my reaction to the application of inventive concept in this case, and I guess counsel for Alice, I think, has been strangely quiet. The patents in this case you know, were not generic computer inventions. They weren't that bad. They act like this is a patent that said, well, you know, there's a switch. If you push a button, the computer comes on. Well, no, the patents actually described a fairly sophisticated technological apparatus. Now, you can quibble about how novel the combination of all the particular attributes was, but saying that you can quibble about how novel the combination of all the particular attributes was doesn't sound much like Section 101. I mean, this was not a really abstract patent on, you know, you know, hedging, and the, it had a very specific technological development that, you know, did particular things. And to say that this is abstract, it's kind of a strange thing. To say it didn't have enough inventive concept is something you could at least write an opinion and defend, but I mean, I think they're trying to use abstraction and they've just decided willfully that they're not going to use novelty. It would have been a good case to say, well, in our view, this is not novel, and so we're gonna decide on that basis, because that's really what I think that they did if they did anything other than just have an instinctive idea, well, this isn't good enough and we're gonna wait till we see one that's good enough. Well, thank you, I finally got one vote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Mann, I'm going to let you start off on the next one since you've had to go last every time and we'll start from that end of the table. Um, and this has to do with sort of the blurring of 101 and 102. Because 101 determinations are questions of law, do they provide an easier way for a court to dispose of a case compared to the factual questions of novelty and non-obviousness? You might say they provide a less institutionally well-suited way to dispose of it if you think that judges don't start off handed down to them from the sky being you know, perfectly informed about all the kinds of facts question, fact questions that would inform a 102 issue. I mean, 102 issues, people have discovery and expert reports and you know, trials. Um, I mean, I've, I do this, these expert reports in these cases and payment system things all the time. They, they, these are important questions. When they reduce to doing it as a one-on-one -on -one thing, I think the judges sort of read the thing. Well, this, this, this doesn't sound very inventive to us, but what do we know about you know financial software? I mean, not that much. Um, so I think inventive concept is very unfortunate to pour that into one-on-one -on -one because it's so inherently factual, inherently situational, um, inherently shifting in time, uh, so that you, you could use some knowledge about what the world looked like the day that the patent application came into the office. Um, yeah, I really agree with that. I think uh, it's uh, it's a problem for. Uh, You've never said that before. I, 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 I agree with you today, Ronald. For this moment, <laughs> <laughs> so, enjoy it. Um, uh, it's um, uh, I, I worry about this particularly for um, the, on the nature side rather than on the abstract ideas side to the extent that there's a distinction that remains between them because we have in 102 a discipline for figuring out what's the state of human knowledge in a field um, that guides decisions uh, uh, and uh, uh, provides sources of, of, of information to look to. We have nothing to guide decisions about what nature knows. Um, uh, so we have you know the Supreme Court relying on expert briefs or something to figure figure out that isolated DNA, well, that's naturally occurring, but cDNA, that's not naturally occurring. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, or like the element that can be created in a nuclear reactor. I mean, it was yeah. in the mind of God. I mean, he knew there's a 132nd element, but I mean, 
perhaps we don't know whether it's ever been created before. Who right. You have, say? you have the, you know, you have making up this magic, imagining a magic microscope, but then nothing, nothing tells you necessarily what that mi magic microscope would reveal, right? A real microscope, but you might be able to look in that and see what it reveals. But, um, uh, you know, we don't have good, in addition to having, I think, very, very um, uh, uh, poor conceptual categories, we have no guidance as to how, how to find out what, what those, what the, what the content of those categories um, uh, is. Um, uh, so, so that's a problem. And then on to the litigators. Are you I, you know, finding 101 is an easier way to try to dispose? I'll answer it as a litigator because I think it's a perfectly comprehensible answer to say you first go through 102, 103, 112, and only if you get all through that do you go to 101. Mm -hmm. Government argued that in Bilski. I filed a brief arguing that in Bilski as well. I thought that made sense at the time. I argued that in Mayo as well. The government hinted that it was wrong in Bilski and they rejected it in Mayo. So as a litigator, when we got to this case, I didn't have a choice. We'd already, <laughs> we'd already crossed that bridge. I mean, if you want to talk about a legislative solution, that would be one. I think that's the reordering it to 399 point, is, is, is you could do that in a way that wouldn't disrupt um, the usefulness of the doctrine for those marginal cases. And we have to remember, these are all the marginal patents we're talking about. 99.9% .9 of patents don't have a 101 challenge. We're only talking about the very tail end of the distribution. Whoa. I see it. All right, take out the 99%. If you, tail live, in, end of the if you live in the place where it's gospel that all software and all business method patents are invalid, which there are parts of this country that's a gospel, that's, that's far more than a small fraction of 1% of the patents. They're anticipating my qu next question. All right, I'm withdrawing the 99% because I don't know. <laughs> Some, somebody at this law school is going to do a data-driven analysis. <laughs> and, and one of the curiosities of, this, of our case, uh, the Alice case, was, of course, it was a pre-Bilski patent. It was prosecuted and allowed under the pre-Bilski guideline. It was, it was allowable under the pre-Bilski guideline. We all agree with that. The, the, then the guidelines changed because of Bilski. Um, so, you know, there has been an evolution Oh, you know, today, how many patents? You know, I still think it's the same. So no one can criticize the PTO for that one. <laughs> Dave. Well, I, I agree with Mark that I think as a, as a litigation matter, it would make a lot more sense to deal with 102, 103, and 112 before getting to 101. And in fact, it's, it's actually hard to imagine that you'd go through that whole process, have the patent survive those tests and then still have a 101 issue. I mean, I, I suppose you, can, you could come up with a hypothetical where that might happen, but as a practical matter, it seems really hard to, to imagine. Uh, you know, you really wonder whether 101 should be a question of law. Uh, you know, it was decided that it was a question of law back before we were talking about an inventive concept and all that sort of thing. Uh, but now, if you're going to be looking, as the Supreme Court did in Alice, at, at textbooks from 50 years ago or what have you, and uh, other sources of what normally would be prior art, uh, should it really be a question of law at all? Now, that, maybe that's a legislative issue. Maybe it's something the court will have to tackle at some point. But it, it, it seems to me there's a mismatch between what the inquiry seems to have become and the, and the standard uh, being applied to it. So should we expect more software-related patents to be invalidated and rejected in the future based on 101 grounds? Does Alice signal a sea change for software patents? Oh, well, the, uh, the Electronic Frontier, Frontier Foundation the other day filed an amicus brief, I think maybe an ultra-mercial, saying that thousands and thousands of software patents are now invalid. Of course, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has a particular view. I think they thought that before, Alice. Uh, but I, I think that so, uh, software patents in general are going to be much more at risk under Section 101 than they were before uh, because, as I s said at the beginning, I think the Supreme Court kind of laid out some, some endpoints uh, for what, it, what, what the test may be. Generic computer components aren't, aren't enough, and if you improve the operation of a computer, that's good. Uh, there's this vast area in the middle. And uh, frankly, a lot of, uh, as I think John may have said, or, or maybe Professor Mann, uh, a lot of the patents, like the Alice patents, a lot of the software patents that are out there now were drafted in a different era uh, when 
uh, patent draftsman didn't think you needed to recite all this detail. The patent office certainly didn't require it. So you've got a lot of patents out there. Uh, there, there may actually be legitimate non-abstract inventions in there, but the patents may not have been drafted in a way that will survive scrutiny today. We're also going round and round a little bit the question of what is a software patent. I mean, I, mm. as Connie knows, I don't think this is a software patent. Um, you know, a, a patent that actually claims a method of doing something on a machine or a device or a set of integrated circuits that could not have been done previously if properly claimed and described and non-obvious and novel and so forth could well be patented. And I think the, the court leaves that point open. The, the, that's the advancement in, in, the, in the technological environment language. Um, it has never actually had a software patent. I, you know, I, I think this patent, my own view, and the court seemed to share it, was that this was Bilski on a generic computer. This wasn't an actual software patent. So I don't know the answer to that question, you know, I, because I think there's, we're going to have another generation of claim drafters, because uh, I do think, we talk about the goalpost problem, the goalposts have shifted again a little bit, and so we're, we're going to need to see the iterative process through the courts of how that, how that plays out. Well, I have two data points on this. One is a partner in our firm who uh, does biotech prosecution, and he gave a CLE, and he said that looking at the Patent Office guidelines in the bio, you know, in the bio area on 101, the only way you can pass 101 muster is if you include an element that will kill the patient. That is the only way. <laughs> if you have anything that's natural and healthy, it is not patentable. And the second is at lunch today, I spoke to a solo um, patent prosecutor whose uh, focus has been on software, e-commerce area or software area, and she's getting out of the practice given, given that mm. you know, software, um, you know, with a small business clientele, it, doesn't, it simply doesn't make sense um, from someone like that uh, who has true software inventions to spend the money that's necessary, maybe get a patent, maybe get it through the patent office, then you're going to be challenged in a PTAB proceeding for two years um, it's, it's no longer viable. So I think it has an impact. Yeah, the only two cases that we've seen in this latest round have been com both computer implemented business methods rather than software patents in some more technological sense. Um, uh, uh, and so it's, it's, it's hard to know what is going to happen. But my expectation would be that broadly claimed software patents are in trouble. Um, uh, that uh, the, they'll, they'll identify an abstract idea, and if it's broad, they'll say its preemptive sweep is too uh, uh, is, is too great. Uh, that there's not enough um, uh, enough narrowing from the abstract idea down to the uh, specific application to uh, count as an invented concept. But it's very hard to say. The, the two cases have been so similar. The Bilski and the Alice case have been so similar to each other that they don't really offer much guidance as to what would happen to other kinds of claims. Yeah, I'm not sure it makes a sea change for software patents per se. And I guess when I say that, I'm speaking of the range markets. I mean, so in the old days when I worked in this area, I read a lot of the patents from Dave's old company and a lot of the patents from Microsoft for various reasons. Well, these are not business method patents. Most of them, these are, you know, Microsoft had a raft of patents on operating systems. These are ways to do computers. Now, these patents all have a very similar structure. They have some really broad, outlandish claims. Can be broken by. by the time you get to, like, claim 13, it's got 18 uh, elements that's going to be, you know, satisfied in one specific, you know, program that will only run in one particular way. I mean, a lot of these claims are very, very specific. And, and um, I don't think it's to make a sea change on those because we, as Becky says, we haven't had one, we haven't had a case about a, an invention that's electronic. And I think that they've shown this tremendous fear to upset the apple cart. And so I think if they got one of these smartphone patents or a patent on an operating system, a patent that's completely intangible, the technology is completely electronic, but it's actually applied technology, I think you might see them you know, get the nerve to say something's patentable. Um, and, and I don't think this case moves it that much because really the patent in this case, the way they decided as they wrote an opinion says, this is just the same as Bilski. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure that was fair assessment of the facts, but they write an opinion that says this is just the same as Bilski, and so the extent it makes a change, it's just, it just shows people we actually really meant it. And we really do want you to work on throwing these patents out, but I'm not sure for the actual industry it's going to make that big of a difference. Well, I, I jump in. as a data point, you know, the software industry, Microsoft and Google and the Business Software Alliance, essentially everybody filed on our side, the bank's side, the challenger side, so di didn't view this case 
had it come out the way it did as a threat to their business model. Now, there's different reasons for that. Some of them don't think as many patents are necessary. Some of them uh, draft patents differently. I mean, there's lots, lots of reasons. I don't, I don't mean to suggest it's a monolithic block. Well, one reason might be that Microsoft is a defendant in you know, more than half of the software patent cases that are brought, so. Many reasons. Mm -hmm. if, if no one on the panel has any other points they'd like to make, I'd like to, because we have another case to discuss, and I'll throw, throw it open to the audience for any questions on, on the Alice case before we move on to the Nautilus case. Considering that uh, Judge Lorry wrote a concurrence finding the claims in um, Ultramarshall to be patent eligible, and he also wrote the plurality of five, which the Supreme Court agreed with in Alice, do you think that Ultramarshall stands uh, in good ground to continue to be found patent eligible? Look at me. <laughs> I, am, I, I am constrained from answering that question in full. Let me answer this. Judge Lurie was vindicated in his application of Mayo to computer technologies. Yeah. That was the debate between Lurie and Rader. Lurie won, or Lurie got nine votes. How that plays out in old commercial, particularly with, now, with former Chief Judge Rader's departure, is a very interesting question. Is that sufficiently diplomatic? Um, and, and nobody else is going to be bolder than me, I guess. No, I agree with, <laughs> I agree with what you said. I think it's an overstatement to say that uh, Judge Lurie was vindicated in, um, uh, in, in Alice. It seems like there was a lot in Lurie's opinion that was not vindicated at all. But It could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about the portion of the court's opinion that, that speaks of conventional solutions or conventional implementations not being sufficient to uh, provide an inventive concept. Does the reference to conventional solutions mean that the standard of what is patent eligible will evolve over time as technology evolves and what, what was conventional, what was novel at one point becomes conventional over time? Well, it's certainly, if you give the word conventional its ordinary meaning, uh, it would seem that it will be an evolving standard, that something that 10 years ago uh, might have been patent eligible 10 years from now will not be, because everything in, that, in those claims is, is now conventional, which I think just highlights the, you know, the, the uh, I think, unfortunate conflation of 101 with 102 and 103. If, if 101 is a threshold legal question, you would think you ought to answer it the same way uh, at the, you know, for every time you ask the question, given the same state of facts. But if, it, if it's evolving like that, it sure sounds to me more like 102 and 103. You know, Justice Sotomayor, I think, asked the same question, argument. And I had to say, yes, it does evolve. I agree Connie has identified an issue. But if we think about this case, you know, 100 years ago, if you said do this on a computer when a computer didn't exist, you'd have a different situation. And so there is some sort of evolution going on there. I think that's one of the tensions that people have been talking about and one that the court has been exploring. So I think it's, it's a very good way to look at one of the um, doctrinal uncomfortablenesses, if you will, in the 101 doctrine. I, 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 I guess I'm a long way of saying I think I agree with Connie on this point. <laughs> Moreover, I think not only in determining whether there's enough of an inventive step, but in, in determining whether there's an abstract idea, the court rested on the fact that hedging, people have been hedging forever. Uh, 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 so um, uh, they, they're, they're treating the, uh, uh, the, the abstract idea, step one portion of the analysis also as a moving target based on uh, they didn't use the word conventional, but, but, but based on uh, what's been in use for a long time. Yeah, I, I just want to follow up and, and then wonder, then how is any mechanical devices patent eligible today? Because presumably levers and cranks and are all insignificant post-solution activities at this point and conventional, 
and all the art of a new machine is in some abstraction that we are able to piece together in our head to, to solve a problem. So, so why have we moved beyond the, the, uh, the conventionality in the computer arts and yet when, and haven't yet moved into conventionality in the more conventional devices? Uh, that, you know, that's a great question and it, frankly it's something that has bothered me about this, uh, the Supreme Court's treatment of, of this area. A computer is a machine. Uh, it's, it's just like an electric motor, just like a lot of other uh, machines. It can do different things in different applications. Uh, I think the Supreme Court has this notion that, well, computers do math, uh, and math is different. Well, computers don't do math. In fact, Mark filed a great, uh, his, his amicus brief in Bilski uh, had a great explanation of how computers are machines, and they don't really do math. They, they work circuits and all of that sort of thing. But I think the Supreme Court has this notion in its head that, that a computer is, is somehow a different kind of machine. So frankly, I think the, the conceptual problem that you identify, and I think it's a legitimate one, I don't think it's ever occurred to the court uh, because they just see computers as completely different. You can see an analogous problem over on the uh, uh, products of nature side. You know that uh, uh, you know everything. Nature uh, always runs through natural processes. <laughs> everything, all machines run through natural processes once you've uh, teed it up. Um, uh, and so I think th this is another reason why I think all the work really is done at, at step one of the uh, this two-step <laughs> analysis is whether you code something uh, as an abstract idea or not. And they're not going to see a uh, more conventional engine part or something like that as a, uh, uh, an abstract idea. They just don't make that move, even though it might be conventional. Uh, the same way that they don't see cDNA as a, natural, uh, you know, as a naturally occurring product, although cDNA is a naturally occurring product. Uh, they just don't code it that way, and it's just their own uh, immediate seat of the pants reaction. Which feeds into the reason why it's hard for this to be a question of law. They've just made a mistake, and this opinion, the person who wrote this opinion wasn't willing to back out of it or turn around and walk back. They've taken another step down this road. It's a bad road. Eventually, they'll have to turn back and recant, but it may be five years, it may be 50 years. Or maybe Congress will do it for them. Um, as far as the general computer test, um, viewing that from the perspective of a software company, you imagine that they want to have their software work in as wide a range of devices as possible. So the, being able to operate on a generic, generic computer is a, it's a selling point for software. So it seems that this test is against the commercial interest and the promotion of the arts and software development. So how do we reconcile this decision with promoting software development? Well, again, I, my view is this, this wasn't a software mm -hmm. patent, and we will see a, a true software patent that is one that describes the logic flows that, that, that instructs a machine, whether a specific machine or a multi-platform uh, implementation, uh, which would be a matter of, of, of drafting. Now, if you were drafting the patent, I would take that into account. You might want to focus on that, but, but I, I don't think that has been resolved here. I think that's what's been left over here. That, that was the software question, really, in my opinion. Hi, uh, I'm going to ask a question about the previous question, actually. The uh, gentleman asked, um, you know, wouldn't just a mechanical invention, you know, with a new cam or something be a, an abstract idea? Well, I would say no, because it's, it's clearly, that would clearly pass the machine or transformation test, right? So I think, at least in what I've seen, it seems like the court treats computers as just a vehicle to transform data. And that fails the machine or transformation test. And so I'm, I'm just sort of wondering how you guys are thinking about how this Alice test interplays with the machine or transformation test. They didn't really talk about that test in Alice, did they? Yeah. So maybe that's not the be all and end all uh, of uh, the analysis of whether a, a conventional uh, uh, mechanical invention uh, uh, is, is abstract or not. I think it just wouldn't occur to them to ask the question. If you want to be generous, you could say that maybe they decided that that application of that test um, was too difficult for federal circuit judges to reach agreement on, so they decided not to say it again, but that <laughs> should be too generous. If you view the point of these opinions is that they take these cases because someone can present a petition that has a federal circuit opinion that's just 
can't be accepted, and they have to have to do something about it because the opinions in this case were so ridiculous at the Federal Circuit. You know, part of writing the opinion here is to come up with an answer without saying the things that were ridiculous in the way the Federal Circuit judges disposed of it. And so they just left that part out because it's hard to apply that test without saying something really crazy. I would answer it in a somewhat more sympathetic manner, which is to say that the machine half, which is what we're dealing with in this area, is a necessary but not a sufficient requirement for patent eligibility. You have to have a machine or one of the other four categories of statutory subject matter to get through the gate. If you have one of those, that, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And this is an overlay on machines in the context of computer-implemented business methods or methods of organizing human activity. And the court seems content at this point in its history to, to leave those, the Bilski-Alice line of cases, just off to the side a little bit. And there's some support for that, of course, in the, in the America Invents Act with the, and the PTAB because of the you know, separate treatment for economic uh, procedures and so forth, that there are some sort of a subset of uh, claims, applications, inventions, whatever they are, uh, that gets a little bit of a different treatment. So it's not totally unmoored from the statute today. All right, we have 15 to 20 minutes left to discuss the other case, Atalus versus Biosig. And if, John, I think I'd like to start off with you and just as counsel for Nautilus and ask, how did, how, did, how did the Nautilus case change the law? Well, as we've heard, it was a watershed, <laughs> which, which was nice to hear over lunch. Um, yeah, my sense, so, so just basically the background, of course, was that in 2001, the Federal Circuit first adopted their test for policing the particularly point out and distinctly claim requirement in section 112.2. And the Federal Circuit test was that if the claim was amenable to construction and then as construed was not insolubly ambiguous, then it was good enough. So for that lasted for about 13 years. Well, that language insolubly ambiguous was, it was curious language. It, it sent a message, I think, to trial courts that basically don't waste your time on this indefiniteness. You're, you're in a patent case. Your chance of being reversed on claim construction is high enough anyway. Well, don't waste your time trying to figure out if this is insolubly ambiguous. So for 13 years, um, indefiniteness wasn't really taken too seriously except in 112.6 context, means plus function. And there, the Federal Circuit was quite strong and rigorous in forcing indefiniteness. But, but generally speaking, it wasn't all that strong. So I think what the Supreme Court did uh, at the argument, Chief Justice Roberts, somebody mentioned insolubly ambiguous, and he correctly said, well, well, no one's defending that. So it basically, the Federal Circuit's test of 13 years was dismissed, you know, with, with this, you know, just, you know, forget it. It's not even in the picture of being reasonable. So what I see is the big point, though, of Nautilus, that one of the two big impacts, one is, Philosophically, this is an important defense. You do need to enforce this particularly point out and distinctly claim uh, purpose. It serves a public notice function that actually helps innovation, follow on innovation of people who pick up a patent, they want to innovate around it. This is an important part of our patent system that promotes innovation and serves the goal of our patent system. So that was one big part. And then the second part was more of an analytical approach the Federal Circuit had a claim construction first approach. First you construe the claim, then you look to see if it gives good notice. And the Supreme Court didn't expressly reject that, but our position is it rejected that. It did say you should not take a post hoc uh, approach. It's not good enough that you can give the claim some meaning. Instead, you have to look at it from the perspective of the follow-on innovator, the day the patent issues or the day the application's filed, and say from that perspective, looking at the claim and the spec and the prosecution history, um, do I have reasonable certainty? So I think the key here is that it's not a post hoc approach. You don't simply construe the claim and then ask, is it clear enough now? It had to be clear enough the day it issued. John, can I just test that a bit? Uh, Claim construction, in theory, is telling you what the claim meant to a person of ordinary skill at the time. It's only post hoc in the sense that everything in litigation is post hoc because you're looking back. But if, you're, if you believe that claim construction is doing its job, then, isn't, then, then what really is wrong or post 
hoc about uh, you know, looking at the claim construction and saying, okay, does this give adequate notice? Well, two thoughts. One is, um, doesn't come up in every case, but it actually came up in our case, is that our uh, patent that we were uh, sued on was out of re-examination. So it's pretty well established in claim construction. If you have a re-examined claim, you get to look at the re-examination prosecution history. Well, that re-examination prosecution history happened 14 years or so after this patent issued. And our argument is the person of skill in the art the day the patent issued didn't have a crystal ball and know what was going to happen in the re-exam. And yet the Federal Circuit panel in our case, uh, we won summary judgment in the trial court and we lost in the Federal Circuit. And the Federal Circuit panel said, oh, one of the reasons we know it's clear is because the examiner in the re-exam accepted this argument or did this other thing. Well, the, the person of skill in the art when the patent issued didn't know that. And then second is claim construction can be very hard and if the court just puts a lot of work into it um, and goes through the current law and figures out a claim construction, the fact that they reached that claim construction shouldn't tip the scales against a finding of indefiniteness. And just as Scalia said that at the argument, he said basically, he said, well, there's always a right construction. Even when there isn't, there is, right? I mean, you've got to come up with an answer. And the problem the Federal Circuit had for 13 years is, well, well, we have an answer. We've construed it. Of course it's clear. Look at it. There's the construction. So I think it's, it's partly that's an answer as well. One difficulty in this area is that in order to exercise active appellate review, um, the, the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court, to some extent, often wants to attribute a meaning to the claim language, and then it become, becomes difficult to say that this is uh, 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 ambiguous. Um, uh, the, even if you have, as often seems to happen, a district court assigning one interpretation and then a split Federal Circuit panel giving two yet different uh, uh, in, in interpretations. That's ambiguity, right? That's indefiniteness, even though everybody has come up with an interpretation and everybody thinks that they've been able to interpret the claim. If, you, if it could mean any of these three different things to three different people who studied the issue closely, then it seems uh, like the claim language is, is, is indeterminate, and that's a problem. I liked this decision. I was really happy about this decision. Okay. Uh, 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 at least I was happy about the outcome. I think they could have been clearer on some points. Uh, perhaps they wanted to leave themselves some room in, in Teva when they have a, a, a claim interpretation case before them rather than a validity case before them uh, to uh, address issues that they may not want to tie their hands on now, like, does it make sense to apply a clear and convincing evidence standard? What is factual? What is, uh, uh, what is legal? Uh, I predict that they're going to want to conclude that it's legal in order to give themselves lots of room for, for appellate review. And yet they've said this is something that we're measuring from a particular hypothetical perspective of a person having ordinary skill in the art as of the, the time of issue, which seems like it's a, a case-specific, factual kind of inquiry where you're going to need to put witnesses on the stand and ask them, does this make sense to you? Can you, can you interpret this language? Is it clear? Uh, what does it mean? Um, uh, uh, but uh, 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 we'll see. So they, they left open some questions that are really important questions, I think, that hadn't yet been resolved. But I like the idea, uh, and it stands in marked contrast to the approach in the subject matter cases where they're saying, eh, claims. We're not going to be hung up on what the claims say. Uh, 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 there may be stuff in the claims that's just, you know, post hoax solution activity. Well, this isn't, we're not just asking about something that's amenable to uh, uh, gaming through the drafts art, uh, 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 they're positively distancing themselves from the, from the claim language as having any bearing. They, they do their own sort of more impressionistic sense of what the, what the invention is and whether that's uh, uh, embracing an, an abstract idea or, or, or natural law or whatever. So I like the focus on claim language um, as central and important um, and as something that uh, uh, applicants could do better on to uh, avoid ambiguity. Um, so I like this, this case. I do too. I think it's an interesting example of how like legal sociology works. If you looked at this opinion and you asked yourself, after you read it really carefully, what's the difference between the standard the Supreme Court has adopted in this case and the standard the Federal Circuit is currently applying? The answer would be, well, probably nothing. I mean, this, and the opinion acknowledges that. What they, you know, what they say is, formally what they say is, you really need to keep those words insolubly ambiguous out of your opinions. You just don't use those words and, and you'll be okay. That's what they say formally, but what they've accomplished, everybody agrees, they've accomplished a lot. What they've accomplished is, the status quo beforehand is, 
District judges are told if you invalidate a patent for being indefinite, you're going to get reversed because nothing is actually in solid and ambiguous. And so if we have to use those words, we'll use them, but you're always going to get reversed. And now that you're told, no, you need to let the district courts say that things are ambiguous and invalidate them. And you take this seriously. And so they didn't change the law because it's really since it's kind of hard to be precise about what it means to be definite. It's in the eye of the beholder. Nothing can be perfectly definite. Um, and few patents that get through the PTO are you know, hopelessly indefinite. And they're just saying, you need to take this seriously. And with district judges, spend a lot of time and say it's indefinite. You don't have to reverse them 100% of the time. Well, kind of, kind of doing the survey that we did about the software patents, what, what does the panel think about? Is this going to result in more patents, be, more claims being thrown out as indefinite? Is it going to change anything? Absolutely. A lot. If you, if you count surviving appeal, I think a lot more patents will be indefinite and survive appeal on that and be dead for patent claims. You know, I would hope, and that this is an aspiration and a prediction rather than a, than a description, this decision, unlike, I think, the Alice decision, it really is designed to influence the primary conduct of applicants, yep. of, of patent holders and would-be patent holders, and it encourages them to write better claims, but also more claims, which may or may not be good. And Professor Eisenberg mentioned the claim by claim approach. You're, you're going to see uh, a dissection, I would predict, in which some, some of the overbroad claims get wiped out and some of the very narrow and specific claims don't. That may matter in software and elsewhere, uh, where we are in a, in a world, in a gray area, if you will. And, and, and going down the road, to produce better patents simply because it's putting the applicants on notice that they have to write at least some of their claims more carefully. I don't, I don't know that that will come out to play, but that's, that's what it ought to do. Well, Mr. Vandenberg will excuse me, but I thought the, one of the most brilliant passages in the Briesness case, which was just really, really well done, was a passage where they talked about the strong incentive of an existing law. Patent drafters have to write a lot yes. of really vague claims because who knows what you can scrape in 20 years later might fall in and they're never going to be held indefinite. And the parts of these briefs where they talked about the, in the CLEs where they're trying to teach people to write indefinite patents, I mean, that was really effective to the court in this primary conduct range. The existing law teaches lawyers that what they're supposed to do is make the patents as vague as possible. And they had to react, I think, to that. Well, I have to say, so so um, so we're a, a IP firm out in out in Portland, no Supreme Court practice, so, but we were smart enough to call Gibson Dunn uh, immediately when cert was granted, and we'd worked with them. And uh, Matt McGill and Jonathan Bond at Gibson Dunn took the laboring oar on the briefs. But one of the things we you know we contributed, and one of the things we contributed is I went down to the library in their office and grabbed the first treatise on the shelf I found, how to write a patent application, open up table of contents. One of the chapters said, include ambiguous claims. Well, I'll scan that. <laughs> and I'll send that off to Jonathan. And I sent it off to Jonathan. He was like, great, let's cite that. And the Supreme Court opinion cites to that portion of our brief talking about we cited treatises and articles about the importance of including ambiguous claims. So um, yeah, so there, there, this, this was, you know, I'm just the patent guy. It was certainly a hoot arguing it. But I think it perhaps helped a little bit. They obviously knew I wasn't a Supreme Court practitioner, but that I could be there and telling them that, yes, this makes sense for a patent drafter to include ambiguous claim that gives you a more powerful patent, it makes it harder to innovate around, and therefore the zone of uncertainty is intentional in many cases, and under the current Federal Circuit's test, there's no reason not to do it, and we need to change that. So I agree with the, the basic point. Don, any prediction on how this will come out on the remand under the new standard? Well, since uh, Biosix Council didn't even come to this panel to defend the patent, I think that's a sign. <laughs> so I'll just leave it there. Uh, the procedurally, the court, the Federal Circuit, has asked for uh, supplemental briefs. We've each put in two rounds of briefs, and they have not yet um, decided whether they'll uh, ask for uh, further argument. They could conceivably send it back to the district court or uh, obviously rule uh, without argument. Presumably, Bio 6 Council would show up for the argument, though. <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, we're just about out of time, but we can open up for questions on this case if there are any. All right, well, there's, there seems to be no questions, so I'd like to thank the panel and the audience for its attention.